for the blessing of knowing Christ through the perfect, inerrant word of God with which you have blessed your people. And so, Father, I pray that you would reveal to us more of Christ. Lord, that we would um, rely upon him. Lord, we would see, Lord, his creative power, not only to do miracles, but to do miracles in us, changing and transforming our character, granting us salvation where there previously was only sin. And Lord, we thank you so uh, much for your working in and through us. Lord, I pray that you would grant us a clearer understanding of who Jesus is, what the gospel is, and how we need to walk in him, and how we ought to glorify him. And so, Father, be our great teacher. Lord, pray that you would be with us even in as I speak in weakness this morning. Father, uh, may your word be mightily proclaimed. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus makes all things new. In this first miracle, we see Jesus doing a miraculous, incredible thing. It's a miracle. But, but more than a miracle, it is also a sign. It's a miracle that proclaims that Jesus was not like any other man. Indeed, we have looked at the first chapter and it is vividly explained to us that, that, that Jesus is the God-man. That, that Jesus was from eternity past. He was always. He is God, very God. He is the creator and the sustainer. He is the author of light and truth. He is God. And so the, the, the objective of the gospel is to give evidences to that, to, to proclaim Christ's glory. And he's going to offer signs. He's going to offer Jesus' miracles. He's, he's amassed evidences and he is giving to us here in this gospel the story of Christ. The story of who he is and what he does. And so in chapter 2 we see this first great thing. This first miraculous thing. But there is a point to the story, and we're going to zoom in on this narrative in order to get to the point. Look at verse 11 real quickly here. <clears throat> and this is beginnings of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and the disciples believed in him. There we really have the purpose statement of this narrative this morning. One that this miracle would put on display God's glory. He is the God-man. He is the incarnate God. He is the Savior. He is the Creator. He makes all things new. And these things are given to us so that we, like his disciples, will come to believe in him. We will come to understand who he is. We will come to understand what he has done. And we will come then to embrace him as Lord and master of our lives, Savior. And we would become his disciples. The scripture is replete with examples and instructions and testimonies that Jesus makes all things new. He does the impossible. Just like in creation, we said in uh, the first chapter of John, it alludes to the fact that Jesus was with God the Father in the creator, the co-creator. He was with God when God created the whole universe out of nothing. 
It is one thing to fix something that is broken and to use the parts and the technologies and the tools that are available to us and be able to fix something. Catch this. Jesus is not fixing here. He is creating new. And this is so important. So important. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 of Christ, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. When there was only death, Christ creates life. Where there was only judgment, Christ creates and makes manifest salvation. There was the old creature that was dead in our trespasses and sins, dead in our way of life, strangers and aliens to the promise of God. We were his enemies. That's who we were as our old man. And here Paul says in Christ, because of Christ's creative work, because of who he is, because he is God, he makes all things new. We are a new creature in Christ. And he reminds us of that is because sometimes even though we've come to know Christ, we creep back into our old things and think that that's the way to go. No, he makes all things new. And therefore, he's given us newness of life. He's, he's given us joy. He, he's given us life to, to walk in. The book of Revelation, verse two, uh, chapter 21, verse 5 says, he who sits on his throne, we just sang about that. Behold, I am making all things new. And he says, write this, for these words are faithful and true. Yet at the end, Jesus makes all things new. This world is, and its sin is passing away. This world and death itself is passing away. In the end, Jesus recreates the heavens and the earth. He makes all things true, uh, new by the power of his might. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Therefore, we who have been buried with him through baptize, uh, baptism into death, so that Christ will be raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so that we too may walk in newness of life. There is an abundant life. There is a newness of life. There is a dramatic difference. And you understand, it's not just about doing new things. It's, it's actually not about us reforming ourselves. This isn't personal reformation. This is divine recreation. This is divine newness. And that's what every soul and every heart needs. They need to be born again. They need regeneration. They need this newness of life, this eternal life, this abundant life, this life in the Holy Spirit that is, that is described in so many love, joy, characteristics. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And as believers, if you are here today, you know that. We need to be reminded from time to time, but we, we know that because we have, we, we acknowledge that we have new life in his name. We have new life because of our relationship to him. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal and to, to kill and to destroy. And Jesus said, I claim that they might have life and have it abundantly. 
This is a saved life. This is an abundant life full of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The manifestations of a saved and regenerate life. John chapter 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you. Jesus said that my joy might be in you and that my joy might be made full. This that we're going to talk about today is a sign miracle. Jesus turns water to wine. And there's a picture there. There is a picture there that that Jesus makes something new. He doesn't fix up what is old. He, He makes something new. He does the impossible. With all things, all things are possible in Christ. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. And so when we come to salvation, we come to Jesus, we come to church, it's never, ever, ever about personal reformation. It's not about, well, you know, boy, I've just got to get a little better. And if I could get my life better, and I, then I can start going back to church. And, and then I, it's not about personal reformation. It's about salvation that comes through the power and person of Christ. The, the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is the need for it. And so let's look at this miracle. Let's look at this sign this morning and see uh, the fact that Jesus can make and does make all things new. And this will be piggybacked on as we get into chapter 3. We learn about the new birth and regeneration. And we, and, and we go from sign to sign. There's going to be eight different sign miracles There are going to be many uh, testimonies of Christ as to who he is. And you remember last week where we left off, look at verse 50 of chapter 1 very quickly. Jesus said to his disciples, Because I have said to you that I saw you under the fig tree. That's He's talking to Nathaniel, remember that, and you believe. You will see greater things than these. And this is the first of the greater things that John lists. And remember, we looked at John chapter 20, and John says, listen, there are many, many things that Jesus did when he was here on earth. The books could not contain all of the things that Jesus did and all of the help that he, and the miracles and the signs that he manifests. But these John has provided, these the Holy Spirit has given us through this revelation, through this perfect word in the Gospel of John, so that we will believe. So that we, too, can come and know the joy and the newness of life and the abundant life with which the Gospel offers. We recognize in chapter 1, Already that Jesus came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And so the last few weeks we're seeing a few of these that have received him, the disciples, the first followers of Christ. And there's an extended invitation for all of us who are going to witness this miracle. We're going to witness his transforming power. We're going to be reintroduced to who Jesus is. He is the author and giver of life. He is the provider of salvation. He is the God-man. And you will be represented to the question, you will be brought to the question The most important question again, who is Jesus and how does that affect me? And these in this 
story of this miracle are confronted with this. Let's look at this this morning. Look at four events. It says outline of four points here this morning so that with these we will see his glory, his superior, abundant, never-ending joy as Christ makes all things new as he pictures that as a sign miracle of Christ turning water to wine, something that is impossible, impossible, but not for God and not for Christ because of who he is. Let's look at that first, uh, first event. We'll, we'll call this the occasion The occasion. So we're going to look at the occasion. We're going to look at the situation. We're going to look at the transformation. And then we'll look at the conclusion. So the occasion for the joy. Look at verses 1 through 2 here. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Now, it mentions the third day. If you look at chapter 1, you'll see the next day and the next day and the next day. Well, this is the third day. This, is, this refers to the third day after Jesus' encounter with Nathaniel. Okay? <clears throat> and Canaan was probably about eight to nine miles from Nazareth, so they've been journeying there. It's where Jesus uh, grew up in Nazareth. We don't know the the social connection, but apparently Mary and Jesus knew the family. And Joseph, probably um, dead by now, as we don't hear anything uh, from him at this point. And John never uses Mary's name, but refers to her as the mother of Jesus. Very tender term there. The disciples at this point would probably be the five men, not the full 12. John doesn't mention the 12. He he doesn't really go into how the other ones came to follow Christ. But this this five would be the Andrew and John himself, Simon, Peter, and Philip, and then Nathaniel. And the occasion, what is the occasion? The occasion is a wedding. And this is so uh, appropriate that that Jesus would come and honor a wedding. This is so appropriate that that Jesus would come and and do his first miracle, his first sign miracle at a wedding. It's almost as if the, the, the New Testament begins with this wedding and then ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation that we alluded to a little earlier. That, that wedding, that, that marriage is a depiction of something very, very, very important. And before we go on, I just want to say a few things about marriage, a few things about the wedding that are so very important. We know nothing about the names of the bride and groom. We, we know, however, the culture. If we're going to understand this miracle, we have got to do some work this morning. When we hear about wedding, when we hear about the purification pots, or when we hear even about wine, it's, there is a cultural difference, and we have to acknowledge that. Uh, When we read the Bible, we've got to figure out first what the culture of the the times of the Bible time was. We have to understand that in its culture, and then we need to principalize that truth and bring it into our own culture. And so when we're talking about weddings, this is not any wedding that you've ever been at, probably. This is not a 45-minute wedding. Wedding ceremony, you know, and uh, people threw some rice and then the bride and groom got in the car and they, they drug the cans in the car and, you know, the, the, the uh, trashed uh, just, just got married sign in the back of the window as they drove off. Maybe there was a small banquet. No, weddings at this day and age last a week, maybe even more. And it was the biggest celebration in all Jewish uh, culture. 
It's a very, very important thing. Um, Samson's wedding feast lasted seven days, according to uh, Judges. The, the marriage feast of the, uh, and the parable of the king's son was large numbers who were invited there. Many, many days' events. And so, it's, this ceremony was something very, very, very significant in that culture. It was a celebration. And those of you fathers who have, son, who have daughters, you're going to like this part. There's a diff, you know, all kinds of cultural differences, but uh, the, the, the groom paid for everything. And the groom would spend a year, maybe more, preparing for the ceremony, preparing the house and preparing uh, the budget and preparing for his reception of the bride. There was first, of course, a betrothal. We saw this in, in Mary and Joseph's story, the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1. The second phase was the profession, uh, procession where the groom and his friends would go to the bride's house after this year of preparation and the, uh, and the preparations for this week-long or maybe even more celebration. And they would joyously lead her and her friends back to his house. And then the celebration would break out. The third stage is described in the, st the text as the wedding feast. And that's what we have here. This is the wedding feast. This is a, a, a year-long preparation of, of the uh, groom getting ready. Ready himself, readying the budget, readying the feast. And, um, <clears throat> and watch more in order to help the, the groom pay for everything, um, the, the wedding gifts were given. Now, we give wedding gifts, and it's just, it's a gift. There, there's no expectation of this. But in this culture, especially within this story here, we have to understand, as we look at this culture, that there was something, that they, they gave great, significant gifts. But these gifts are actually given with the view that their food and drink is going to be taken care of for a week. And get this, again, this is not our culture, so it's not the way we think. But there are instances in, uh, in those times where actually, uh, if the groom uh, failed to prepare an adequate feast for everyone, and in this case, running out of wine would illustrate that, that the uh, bridal party would actually sue the groom. Can you imagine that? I mean, this isn't like, you know, uh, running short on the punch for the bank or for a potluck. You know, this is very, very significant. This is beyond social embarrassment and shame for something like this to occur. But again, those are some of the cross-cultural differences that, that we need to see in this text. But nonetheless, this is a great honor to be a part of the wedding. It's a great celebration. It lasts for a week. And, um, and, and this is appropriate. It's appropriate because marriage is defined by God. He is the author of marriage, by the way, not the state. That's so important to say out loud. It's not the state that defines marriage. And it's not our culture either by the way. It's not the desires of men. Marriage is a condition of life designed by God and ordained by God. We could take the time and go back to Genesis, but it is God who, who brings a bride and a groom together. It is God who ordains the marriage. It is, it is the ceremony that then uh, brings that public recognition of what God is and has done. The ceremony, the wedding, is the place and the time when a marriage and a new family is recognized, witnessed, authenticated in an open and public covenant. When, when the, the bride and groom come up before the preacher and, and they give themselves to one another in covenant, they are also giving themselves to God in covenant. 
And all who are in attendance are, are not merely bystanders. They are witnesses of these things. They are testifying. They are recognizing. They are publicly ratifying that this is the creation of a new family. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman. And show her honor as a fellow heir of... Look at the way that he describes marriage. The grace of life. The grace of life. Marriage is a common grace. It's not efficacious grace. It's not saving grace grace, but it is a common grace. It is, the, it is a grace of life. Peter re- calls husbands to recognize that so that their prayers may not be hindered. That is, so, that is how it is so and why it is so important. The most wonderful thing, the most blessed of common graces When we talk about common grace, we mean, again, that this is a grace that God gives to all men, uh, regardless of whether they believe in him or not. It is the establishment of the family and the family unit and cultures that embrace what God has ordained all the way back in Genesis are blessed through this family structure. And culture upon culture, you can see this. Societies that respect culture are blessed. Again, marriage is vital. It it, it is vital. It is vital to a culture. It is vital to a nation. And it is vital that we in the church... Never turn marriage or the marriage ceremony into something that it is not. It cannot ever be designed by the state, defined by the state. It can never be defined or ordained by our culture. No, it is given to us by God, and it is God who does it. Matthew 19, verses 4 and 6 make this very, very clear. He answered and said, Have you not read? That he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. Boy, is that important these days. And said for this reason that a man shall live his, leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And so they no longer two but one. Therefore, get this, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Who does the joining together? It's not the state, it's not the culture, and it's not the whims of the opinions of men. It's God. Jesus is respecting marriage here. Jesus is honoring this wedding by his presence. Jesus is witnessing and he is among those who are, uh, <clears throat> who are witnessing and, and uh, embracing this New, the establishment of this new family, we again don't know uh, precisely who that is or whatever, but we, we, we see this and we have to take a step back and acknowledge the situation, uh, the, the occasion that is. Now let's move to the situation and this is, whew, uh, this is a situation that would knock the wind out of anybody in that day and age. Again, very, very serious when the uh, groom cannot provide for the feast. It's very, very serious. It's more than a cultural faux pas. It's more than a wedding screw up. And I tell you what, as a pastor, I've seen a lot of wedding Faux pas, and you know, we laugh about them, and, they, and and we, you know, and everybody kind of picks up the pieces and and moves with it. Over the years, I've told you know, bride and groom, and and all the people standing up in front, said, "Don't lock your knees." And so there's always somebody not nah, lock their knees. So what? Poof, you know, they fall over. You just pick them up, and it's no big deal. Everybody gets a giggle, and it's sort of a 
you know, a funny relief or whatever, um, you know, or, uh, you know, the ring bearer drops the ring or loses the temporary, you know, there, there's just all kinds of different faux pas that happen, different mess ups that happen in a wedding. Uh, a lot of times I'll tell a bride and groom, it's just not a matter of if, it's just when and how bad. So we're, we'll do our best to prepare and we'll be ready. But here, this situation is a whole lot more serious. And so we've got to make that cultural leap. We've got to understand that cultural, culturally. And so verse 3, catch this. When the, ran, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. This isn't they're running out. This is literally they are having no wine. They're, the wine is completely dried up. Um, and this is a not only a huge embarrassment in, in a um, in a culture where uh, where that would just hit different with us, um, and, and so this is a serious serious uh, situation, serious situation. And so Jesus, or Jesus' mother, Mary, is there, and she has some responsibility. We don't know exactly the connection or whatever, but she's there probably serving, as you would think Mary, uh, Mary would, would do as, as a part of her character. And she brings Jesus this situation. Now, a lot has been read into this, but you think about this, okay? Jesus has been, been at home with Mary for some 30 years. And Jesus is the wisest, wisest of men. Uh, he knows what to do. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having a I had a brother who always thought he knew what to do. But Jesus always knew what to do. So why wouldn't Mary come and say, Jesus, we have a huge, this is a huge problem. What do we do? But I think there was more to this, her question, than just that. And we picked up some of that flavor in verse 4. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. And see, there's quite a bit of background here. Do you see? Because it's been 30 years. Mary understood who Jesus is probably more than most, if not the most, she was there when the angel told her that she would bear a son. She was there when he was born. He was, she, she witnessed all of that. We, we have the Mary's Magnificat. We understand Mary knew who Jesus is. And for 30 years, he's kind of been out of the spotlight. He's, he's been caring for his family. He's been conducting life as a carpenter's son. But Mary has seen in the last couple of days, it's been a very exciting week. We saw Jesus' baptism. We saw the fact that uh, the heavens opened up and declared that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And, uh, and all of them witnessed that. They saw the interaction with John the Baptist. She saw him calling disciples. She's seeing all of this and she said, it's now Jesus' perfect time. Perfect time for you to usher in the kingdom at this wedding. That would just be great. Let's turn this celebration into a real celebration. Jesus answered her with something, again, that we need to culturally understand. She says, woman, what does this have to do with us? Now, sons, don't go home and say this to your mother. And say, oh, the preacher said it was okay. No, listen, it's culturally understood there. You know, if we said this, it probably wouldn't go off too well. But you understand, when Jesus addresses her as woman, it's not disrespectful. Um, but there is a distance there. There's a distance in his, in his reply. Woman, what does this have to do with us? And there needs to be an understanding of an acknowledgement of a transition. The acknowledgement of the transition is that Jesus now is going to begin his public ministry. Jesus is going to step outside of his house. 
Jesus will continue to carry for his mother, but that's not his prime concern. And Jesus will respond this way even in the cross. You remember what he says to John. He says to John, and he addresses, and, and, and to John, he says, just take care of my mother. He uses very similar language. And then he says this important phrase, and we're going to cover a lot more of this later because it's going to appear several times. My hour has not yet come. John is full of this. My hour has not yet come. With each, almost each miracle, he'll say, my hour has not yet come. It's not time to usher in the kingdom. It's not time for the death, burial, and resurrection, the greatest glory to come, the greatest proof to come. It's not yet. So Mary responds to this situation and responds to Jesus. Look at verse 5. His mother said to the servants, okay, whatever he says to you, you do it. Well, that's not bad advice, right? Again, she grew up, her, her, uh, Jesus' whole life has been helping her, serving at home, giving wise counsel and so forth. And, she, and Jesus kind of rebuffs her first idea. And, she, and then Mary says, yeah, okay, you're right, she will do whatever it is that, that you do, do whatever he says. And that leads us into the transformation. So, so we go from the occasion to the situation. This is a desperate, embarrassing, uh, devastating for a wedding situation. And um, Jesus now, uh, Mary says, do whatever Jesus says. And so Jesus says now, okay, there's the instructions. and gives us this uh, first miracle, the transformation of water uh, to wine. Look at verse 6. And now there were six stone pots set for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 12 or 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. Notice there was no room to add anything. That's important because there are some liberals who don't want to see anything supernatural in the Bible. And they say, well, you know, back in the biblical times, they, they did mixed wine. So probably they filled up most of these uh, pots with water and they added wine. And, and everybody thought, oh, gee, look at what Jesus did. No, that's not what's going on here at all. The text gives us, goes out of its way to say they filled it up to the brim. There wasn't anything else in there but water. Verse 8, and they said to them, draw out some now and take it to the waiter. And so he took it to him, and the waiter tasted the water which, he had, become, which had become wine. It's so simplistic here. It, it, it's so much, th this miracle is somewhat veiled. Right? The, the head waiter doesn't know what's going on. He, he only knows, wow, this is wine. The servants... You know, they're not, Jesus doesn't say that, okay, this is the plan. Jesus doesn't pray over the water pots. He doesn't say anything to the water. He doesn't lay hands on the water. He gives instruction. And the head waiter tasted the water and it become wine. And notice here again, the testimony of the head waiter and he did not know where it had came from, but the servants who had drawn knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom. Oh, I've got good news for you. I got, I'm going to save this very, very embarrassing, devastating situation. And he said to him, every man serves good wine first. When the people had drunk freely, and he serves the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. What's going on here? The head waiter thinks the bridegroom did it. So there's no, tri there's no uh, sleight of hand in this miracle at all. No, we see a miraculous, powerful uh, sign miracle that Jesus causes water to become 
wine. And there is symbolism flowing through all of this as well. Look at chapter 6 and it says, The six stone pots were set for the Jewish custom of purification. Again, another customary situation that we need to know about. The Jews in their religious practices, there's something called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah is a commentary on Levitical practice of Levitical law. And they extend this and they make the Mishnah authoritative and they go beyond that which is written. And they had all of this um, history and all of this custom that pertains to this purification. It goes way beyond what Levitical law commands. There are some literal... Uh, 1,000, over 1,000 different instructions pertaining to purification. That is the cleansing of different instruments used in worship, as well as the hands and feet. So that's what these six uh, uh, stone pots were set for this custom, and they were empty. That's great symbolism there. Well, we've talked about the, how, how bankrupt the Jewish system was. Jesus shows up on the scene. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. Why? He says, you've got to come out from that system. It's a broken system. It, it's a lifeless system. Uh, there's, there, it's an empty, an empty system. So there's some real symbolism there that I think we need to pick up. And these, these uh, six stone pots, 20 or 30 gallons each, 180 gallons of water, it would have been a lot of work for these servants to do what they did. And filling the water pots, they filled them to their brim, and, <clears throat> they, they, and he said, take, so this is the instruction that Jesus says, take, Take and draw some out. Take it to the head waiter. And so they took it to him. And they're just thinking, why are we taking water? Water, Because the other important issue with regard to wine and water and so forth, water was, you know, we we didn't have bottled water, you know. Now this looks really clear because it's bottled and it's, you know, it's, it's filtered and it's clean. And it works good. Not only that, we got we got we got uh, two refrigerators in the basement. They didn't have any of that. And so you take a sip of water back in those days. You're kind of taking your life in your own hands. What, what kind of what kind of? It was an iffy situation. So wine was a purification agent for water. Throughout the Bible is also a picture of great joy because it brought great refreshment and an environment and the desert and so forth. And, uh, you know, we get famished. We get uh, thirsty. And the water wasn't all that trustworthy. And so the servants must have said, why are we taking these drugs of water into this? This is not going to go over too good. Well, again, Jesus transforms this. There are some who say, well, it really wasn't really wine. No, it was really wine. It was wine. The word means wine. It was wine. The, the, the head waiter was not here endorsing drunkenness at the same time. So there's two ways that we can kind of fall off the cliff here in looking at this. We can say one is some are very, 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 very uncomfortable because, again, they're not going and evaluating the culture of the biblical times. They're importing our culture into the biblical times. And they go, how in the world can Jesus make wine? Everybody's going to get drunk. That's not what's going on here. So it's led some people to say, well, it wasn't really wine. No, it, it, it's real wine. The, the, other, the other way we could fall off it, it is again to think, well, 
you know, I, I guess everybody was drunk. That, isn't that what he's saying in verse 10? No, this is a common expression. It's a common practice. The waiter would save the best wine, the best wine for the first, and when everybody's palate was fresh. And then later on, the, the stuff that wasn't as good. And the point of verse 10 is that this is a picture of newness, of freshness. This is a picture of abundance. This is a picture of, it's not going to run out, by the way. 100, 180 gallons of wine would have been more than enough for this huge wedding. And it would have served probably as a gift to the bride and the groom later on. Serve them financially. And, and so this is such a tr tremendous thing, but this is not drunkenness here. Every man serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, it doesn't mean, doesn't say when they are drunk. It, it, me it merely means when after they have drank little, and again, drunkenness in that culture isn't what it is in our culture. Nowadays, when I go to a wedding, I'm going, Ugh. you know, if I'm, I'm going and they're serving alcohol, I'm going, Ugh. people act, they get drunk and they act like idiots. You know, and it's not even a matter of if, it's when, you know. And, you know, drunkenness is not only accepted in our society, but we, we all think it's hilarious. Not so in this culture. No. No, no, one, no one would go out of their way to do that. No one would embrace that. That person would be dismissed. And in fact, in that culture, they would regularly water down the wine because they're going to be enjoying it for a week. So they would water down that wine. There are times when they didn't. But in an extended invitation like this, they would be concerned about that. And so, and you're and you're you're serving not only adults but kids and so forth. And so they would regularly do that. They would add water to it. And drunkenness is a sin. Know that God in Christ would never contribute to this. And it's so important that we understand that. Wherein wine is not a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler. And whoever is intoxicated it, by it is not wise. That's very, very strong. The wine there is unmixed wine, strong drink. And let me say, there is a difference. There is a difference between wine there and wine now, or, or I should say not wine, but strong. We have stronger alcoholic content in some of our beverages than they did. Proverbs 32, verse 29 and 30, through 35. Who is woe? Who is sorrow? Who has complaint? Who is contentions? Who is wounds without cause and redness of eyes? Those who linger over wine, those who go to taste mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At last it tastes bitter like a serpent and stings like a viper, and your eyes will see strange things, and your mind will utter perverse things, and you will be like the one who lies down in the middle of the sea or like one who lies down on the top of a mast. They struck me, I did not, <clears throat> and I did not become ill. They, they beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. What a vivid picture of what it means to be intoxicated and drunk in all the accompanying ailment that that has. Believe me, Jesus had no part of this. Jesus wants us to have no part in this. That's why we must see the biblical culture for what it is. 
in contrast with our own culture. Luke chapter 1, 21, verse 34. Be on your guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. The day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. Romans 13, 13. Let us behave properly in the day, not as carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in striving and jealousy. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, envy and, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like this, of which I forewarn you, just as I forewarned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Drunkenness is a very, very serious thing. And the scripture forbids it. Proverbs 31. Verses 4 and 5. It is not for kings, O Limen. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink, for they will drink and forget what is decree and will pervert the rights of all the afflicted. There's a direct admonishment for leaders. Leaders are not to drink strong. They need to keep their head. They need to keep their wits. That They need to, to, to be full of the Spirit. Not full of, full of alcohol. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. So the believer is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's not to be filled with alcohol. So again, I'm not saying, I'm not going to forbid anything that the Bible doesn't forbid, but I'm going to severely warn you, be very careful with this decision of yours to take up wine, to take up any alcohol. It would be better for you not, but I do not want to go beyond that which is written but I do want to severely, severely warn you. This is a snare that has has encapsulated many in our culture. It's a snare and a struggle. It affects everything in in, in, in the lives of those who've given themselves over to this. So that's why when we go through and we read this and And you can hear the voice of those in the world who do not know Christ who say, well, Jesus made wine, let's drink. Do he so irresponsibly, doing so without a measure of caution, doing so without a measure of God forbidding drunkenness. So do not think for a moment that this would endorse that behavior. I hope I made that clear. But here you have, in this wonderful announcement of the head waiter getting back to more of the context here, he's saying that this blessing with which Christ had miraculously produced, he had creatively, powerfully produced Wine from water. It is a miracle. God creates new things. He makes things new. And this is a picture of abundance. This is a picture of joy. This is a picture of a fulfillment of a tremendous need. So there is great, great joy in this announcement. That leads us into our conclusion In verse 11 and 12. This beginning of great signs Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee. Again, it's not about the water. It's not about the wine. It's about what it pictures. What does it picture? It pictures Christ as the fulfillment. It pictures Christ as giving new life. It pictures Christ as being the answer. It it, pictures... Pictures Christ as being God, who is 
the creator and sustainer and giving of all abundant, joyful life. This is the sign. This is the manifestation of of God's glory. And it's very interesting here that, that only certain people knew. At this point, is private. Now it gets written down in the gospel. It's no longer private. Praise the Lord. We're, we get to be in on it as well. But in the beginning there, it fell to a very small audience. And verse 12 gives us that audience. It was his mother. It, 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 it was the waiters there. It was his brothers and his disciples. And that gives us two responses, by the way. We know it says that the disciples saw. Again, Jesus has already said, you're going to see greater things. And guess what? Three days later, they saw greater things. Water to wine. And so the disciples believed in him, verse 11. We know, looking at the, ver- at the list of those who saw and were uh, privy to this miracle, that also had his brothers, some extended family members. Uh, we know, we won't take the time, as a running late. You're shocked by that. Um, <clears throat> I thought his voice was going to run out of gas. Sorry. Um, his brothers didn't immediately believe Can you imagine that? They saw with their own eyes what happened here. They saw the same things that the disciples saw. They saw the same things that Mary saw. And they didn't believe. They didn't believe. Well, the story gets better as is the uh, um, James, the brother of Jesus, we know, comes to faith later on in life. But at this point, they don't believe. So we come to this, and we're confronted by this miraculous thing with which they saw with their own eyes, and now we have testimony to. We have incontributable evidence of what has happened here. we are all come to grips with this miracle, and we have one or two response. Jesus is who he says he is, and I need to believe like the disciples, or I'm going to reject it because it's not comfortable. I'm going to reject it because I don't. I want to be the Lord of my own life. I want to reject it because I don't really need a Savior. I'm not very, I'm not, I'm not a bad sinner. I mean, I, I do bad things, but I, I'm not really a sinner. I don't, I don't need Jesus in this way. So again, we come to this point and we just get, where are you? Are you with the disciples? Are you witnessing this and go, Wow. Thank you, Lord, that that you invited me to behold this. Further evidence, further confidence. And just as you made water, uh, uh, you made wine from water, you've created a new heart in me, and I'm a new creature in Christ, and I am amazed because I know what I was and what I am now and what I will be. Thank you, Jesus. Or you'd be like the brothers. I don't want to see that. There has to be some other explanation for what my eyes saw. I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to give up lordship in my own life. I, I don't want to submit to Christ. But I'm going to reject it. I walk away from this incredible evidence and this incredible invitation. Be careful. Be careful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for uh, this time where we too got to behold the miraculous, where we got to see the greater things of which Jesus did. And Lord, I just pray that that we would come in faith and we'd come acknowledging the promises in your word. We would acknowledge your ability to, to, to create new 
for that is our only hope as believers. We know we are all sinners worthy of punishment. And Lord, if we're ever going to see heaven, we need to be holy. We need to be made new. We need to be new creatures in Christ. So Father, we just thank you that that you are able to save. You are mighty to save. Father, I pray for anyone here, here in my voice or here this morning that is like the brothers. See, this is uncomfortable what I've behold, beheld. I, I don't feel like I need it. For, for whatever re- reason, walked away from that event and still disbelieved. Lord, I pray that you would call them. Lord, speak to their spirits, Father. Convict them of sin and their need of righteousness. Convict them of the written word which proclaims Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life of which they can come to you. And so, Lord, drive home that need in their life and their heart, we pray. Again, may we glorify you as the author of all good life and eternal life. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen.